In the not-so-distant future, traditional screen-based gaming makes way for immersive, full-dive VR experiences. The gaming landscape becomes inundated with subpar titles, riddled with glitches and dubbed trash games. Despite imperfections, a fraction of players fixate on conquering these challenges. Rockero is one such dedicated trash game hunter, known by his in-game name, Sunraku. Meanwhile, Rakuro's classmate, Rei, harbors a crush on him, but is too shy to initiate a conversation. After multiple weeks of slogging through completing his latest game, Rakuro gets tired and ends up mentally burned out. Persuaded by Mana, the local shop owner, he shifts gears to indulge in a glitch-free mainstream game. Shangri-La Frontier with 30 million players. Remaining true to his favorite playstyle, Rakuro crafts a wanderer character adorned with twin blades, enhanced luck attributes, and minimal armor, opting for swimming shorts and a bird head mask. By skipping the in-game introduction, Rakuro plunges straight into monster battles, en route to the starting town, Firstia. Leveraging his augmented luck, Rakuro quickly levels up, marveling at the seamless gameplay without any glitches. Eventually, he decides to forego Firstia and venture to the more advanced town, Second Secondo. However, the bridge leading there is guarded by Firstia's area snake boss, leading Rakuro to jump headfirst into the battle with enthusiasm. Rei, already a mighty warrior in Shangri-La, travels to Firstia with the hope of crossing paths with Rakuro as he starts his gaming journey. Her anticipation turns to disappointment when Rakuro is nowhere to be seen. She assumes that he's already visited Firstia and left before her arrival. Despite Rakuro's experience and skill in boss fights, he finds himself on the brink of death, unaware that the snake boss usually requires a team of at least three players. While his victory propels him to level 14, the remaining effects of snake venom continue to lower his health. Forced to flee, Rakuro journeys to Secondo, where the seasoned player, Reiji, aids him in registering a respawn point to avoid restarting the game every time he dies. Upon respawning, Rakuro realizes that his unique swimming shorts draw unwanted attention, making him stick out like a sore thumb. This leaves him no choice but to invest in conventional armor, albeit retaining his signature bird mask. In need of new weapons, the blacksmith directs him to Dire Marsh Swamp for ore mining, a more challenging task than Rakuro initially assumed due to the realistic swamp mud impeding his movement. Armed with marsh daggers, Rakuro discards the blacksmith's warnings and ventures to hunt monsters in the night. Meanwhile, Rei sets out to search for Rakuro in Second Dill, despite the unlikely odds of a new player navigating that far solo. Rakuro ends up facing a rare and highly leveled monster that none of the game's 30 million players have ever defeated. A Lysagon Night Slayer. Well, you know what they say, play stupid games and win stupid prizes. Should have listened to that blacksmith. Rei discovers that Rakuro has already advanced to Second Dill. Other players take note that Rei belongs to one of the seven clans dedicated to hunting the seven unique beasts, with her clan specifically targeting the Lysagon. Despite executing flawless strikes on Lysagon's critical weak points, Rakuro loses his legs in a vicious attack. Still determined, he swears to locate and defeat Lysagon before progressing any further in the game. Upon respawning, Rakuro grapples with Lysagon's curse, making him unable to equip armor on his legs or body. Body. Although now immune to magic, he can no longer fight with monsters weaker than himself. And on top of that, NPCs treat him differently. The curse proves permanent unless removed by a saint or by defeating Lysagon. Forced back into his trusty swim shorts, Rakuro unexpectedly encounters a unique scenario. An invitation to the Rabbit City, Rabbituza, which he accepts, unaware that the recommended skill level for entering the city is level 80. He receives congratulations from the whole White Rabbit Amul for embodying the spirit of the Vorpal Rabbit, willingly confronting a superior enemy while targeting only the weak points. It turns out that Lysagon's curse was, in fact, a mark of recognition, signifying that the unique monster considers Rakuro a worthy opponent. Consequently, Rakuro becomes the first player ever invited to meet Rabbit King Vaisash. In a flashback, it's revealed that Rei began playing the game on Mana's advice, with the promise that Mana would also convince Rakuro to join, allowing Rei to get closer to him. So for her, this game is basically a digital Tinder for nerds. Rakuro, consulting online walkthroughs, confirms his unique status as the first and only player to meet Visash. Visash extends an invitation for Vorpal training and equips Rakuro with a collar, reducing experience gains by 50%, but boosting stats gains by 250%. An Expected invite to burp, an old trash game serving as a gathering spot for hardcore trash hunters, comes from his online friend, Katsu. Katsu is confused about Rakuro playing a mainstream game until Rakuro reveals his rivalry with Lysagon. This new information tempts Katsu and another trash hunter, Arthur Pencilgon, to consider
consider joining Shangri-La. With numerous new players during summer break, Rakura temporarily departs from the unique Vorpal scenario to focus on reaching the next town, Third Rema. Imul accompanies him as an NPC follower, allowing them to teleport back to Rabitza as well. However, Rakuro becomes the center of attention due to Imul, with players eager to discover how to obtain an Imul NPC. Rakuro notices weak monsters now run away from him and decides to confront the area boss, Mud Digger, to unlock travel to Third Rema. Unfortunately, the swampy terrain impedes Rakuro's movement once again. Rakuro, attempting to make good use of his skills, faces imminent death until Emul intervenes. Accustomed to solo play, Rakuro forgot that Emul is his party member and can assist in battles. Dealing considerable damage to Mud Digger, Rakuro is propelled into the air, facing a deadly fall that no skill can evade. Fortunately, Unfortunately, Emul teleports him atop Mud Digger, transforming the fall into an overpowering headbutt that instantly slays the area boss. While Rakuro is pleased with the victory, his victory is soured with disappointment for using Emul, recognizing her strength surpasses his own. Approaching Third Rema, Emul takes on a human girl disguise, yet Rakuro, sporting only shorts, yet again attracts unwanted attention. Unfortunately, pictures of him have spread like wildfire, revealing that he has a unique NPC and has confronted Lysagon. This draws the notice of Saiger, a member of Rei's Lysagon hunter clan and numerous members of Ashura Kai, an assassin clan that takes pleasure in killing other players. Rakuro is approached by Animalia, an animal-obsessed player seeking her own Vorpal Rabbit NPC. Distracted by her, Rakuro faces a near-death experience at the hands of Arthur Pencilgon, a level 99 player killer. Rakuro identifies Arthur as a fellow trash game hunter. He knows him from a post-apocalyptic trash game where players often prioritize battling each other for resources over the seemingly impossible main quests. Arthur ascended to the position of queen and the unofficial final boss, the dystopian empress. In the game's ending, Rakuro went on a suicide mission to kill her, marking the beginning of their unique friendship and rivalry. Arthur, who traveled from the 50th city, Fiftica, is determined to eliminate him. And Amalia exposes Arthur as the level 99 second in command of Ashura Kai, specializing in assassinating players even higher in level than herself. As they clash, Arthur conveys a demand from Ashura Kai's leader to publicly disclose how to access the unique scenario for Vorpal Rabbit NPCs. Emul, unable to keep her human form, reverts to a rabbit. To shield Emul, and Amalia confronts Arthur allowing Rakuro to sprint for Third Rema's gate to set a respawn point. However, his path is obstructed by Arthur's fellow assassins, and Amalia ends up defeated, succumbing to the effects of poison magic that slowly starts killing her. Out of the blue, Rei saves Rakuro. She finally tracked him down through her sister, Siger 100, and from the picture of him with Lysagon's mark. She is a pro stalker. Arthur is overjoyed to see Rei, who goes by the in-game name Siger Zero. This small distraction is enough to allow a window for Anamalia to attack her with magic. Anamalia's spell results in the demise of both herself and Arthur, catching the assassins off guard and enabling Rakuro to slip away into Third Drema. Rei is over the moon that Rakuro briefly talked with her, but holds the assassins responsible for the conversation's brevity, promptly killing them to take her frustration out. Arthur takes her defeat in good spirits, extending an invitation for Rakuro to talk later in the post-apocalyptic game, alongside their mutual online friend, Katsa. Rakuro uses teleportation to reach Rabatuza and starts playing the unique scenario. His initial training session makes him confront a group of pack hounds, all level 65 or higher. Meanwhile, Rei decides to send Rokuro a friend request the next time they meet in-game. After enduring seven deaths, all one after another, Rokuro deciphers the Packhound's attack patterns and emerges victorious. The challenge grows as his adversaries escalate in strength, comprising an Exu Panther, a Twin Head Tiger, and a Golem. Despite the challenges, he only attains level 31 due to the Vorpal Caller's reduced experience points. The Sash appears to witness the 10th fight against a specially captured monster for Rakuro, the Aberrant Wood Mage, a level 120 tree-type sorcerer. The monster is so formidable that even Vasash stipulates that Rakuro only needs to survive for five minutes to claim victory. Rakuro confronts the formidable wood mage, discovering its imperviousness to physical attacks, leaving him with the sole option of evading its assaults. As mental
mental pressure and exhaustion set in after two minutes, Rokuro contemplates the ease of dying in training matches since there were no penalties as he could just respawn. This leads to him wallowing in self-disgust at his inclination to always take the simplest path to victory in trash games. His successful theft of Wood Mage's staff gets rid of its spellcasting abilities, allowing easier evasion until the time expires, securing Rokuro's victory. Breaking the rules, an enraged wood mage attempts to kill him, only to be slain by the sash. In return, Rokuro is granted his reward, the title of an honorary Rapatuzan citizen, and the removal of the troublesome Vorpal Collar. Initially disappointed, Rokuro's citizenship unlocks another unique scenario, the Vorpal Epic, with intricate instructions that need research into Shangri-La's detailed world history. And our boy was like, keep that nerd stuff away from me, and just let me explore the game. Rokuro opts to delve into the main game and explore instead. Unable to equip clothes to his torso, Emul's brother, Pete, provides Rokuro with a kefia headdress and a full-body robe to conceal his identity from assassins. Contemplating a visit to the cities of Fourfolkshire, Fiveville, or Sixenvelt, Rokuro catches Ray ominously watching him. Arthur, repulsed by Ashura Kai's perceived weakness under the leadership of Orcelot, expresses disdain for their transformation from proud assassins to a clan focused on accumulating experience and hoarding equipment due to the penalties imposed on murderers in the game. As the only clan aware of the unique monster, Weather Montambagard's location, they hesitate to attack, fearing the loss of valuable equipment. Disgusted by this reluctance, Arthur decides to take matters into her own hands and eliminate Weathermon. Rakuro is taken aback when Ray sends him a friend request, still unaware that Siger Zero is actually Ray. Rakuro believes she aims to manipulate him for access to the unique scenario, so he agrees to the request, intending to manipulate her in return. Now online friends, Ray acknowledges his preference for solo play and allows him to journey to Fourfolkshire alone. She's in no rush and is thinking of starting a conversation later as she has his contact now. Rokuro, with Emu by his side, ventures through the prismatic forest. He marvels at the diversity of insect-type monsters. Witnessing a battle between empire bees and a quad beetle becomes just the cherry on top. He capitalizes on the situation and decides to target the now-weakened beetle. He defeats it with ease and grabs all the drops. With that out of the way, Rokuro sets his sights on the area boss, Clown Spider. But before he can battle it, he needs to find it. Rokuro's entry is denied, and when he's left with no choice but to wait for his turn to enter the boss arena in Fourth Brookshire, as other adventurers are currently attempting to beat the boss, after observing their unsuccessful attempts, Rokuro confronts the Clown Spider. Determined to grow stronger, he asks Emil not to assist him. He strategically weakens the spider by knocking from its web, dropping boulders on it, and finally targeting its critical weak point. Even though he was fighting an area boss, Rokuro emerged victorious without taking any damage, making it look easy. Sunraku receives an email from Arthur, inviting him and Katso to help defeat Weathermon. Katso reluctantly started playing the game and had already made incredible progress, defeating Muddigger. According to Arthur's invitation, they'll set out on their mission in two weeks, following a huge game update that massively expands the game, adding new characters, missions, and areas to explore. Rakuro, suspicious of Arthur's motives, contemplates her invitation. In the real world, Rei manages to speak to Rakuro briefly, although in true protagonist fashion, he barely remembers her name or their shared school. Before Rei can reveal herself as Siger Zero, Rakuro leaves in a hurry to meet Arthur. Despite this, Rei considers their conversation a huge success. Imul, fearing Rakuro's plans to fight Weathermon, rushes to inform the Sash. Rakuro later learns from Arthur the consequences of NPC's death in Shangri La. If an NPC dies, their death is permanent and they won't respawn. He realized that Emil's demise would be permanent, bringing a forced end to the special Vorpal scenario. The Sash expresses uneasiness with Rakuro's plans, but Rakuro clarifies that Ashura Kai exploits a game mechanic by initiating a fight with Weathermon and then avoiding the battle to harvest experience. In contrast, Arthur intends to provide Weathermon with the honorable battle he deserves. The Sash, understanding Weathermon's plight of undeath and his inability to join his wife in the afterlife, sympathizes with the monster guarding his wife's tomb. Acknowledging that granting Weathermon death is an honorable act true to the Vorpal soul, he takes Rokuro's Vorpal Chopper knives and ascends them. 
To improve the knives, Basash draws from Mercuro's experience in battling Lysagon and the armor of the Quad Beetle. The final creation is the Vorpal Knives Moonblade of Waxing and Waning. One of them lets the wielder unleash powerful strikes, but takes away some of the wielder's health in return. The other restores health at the same rate it's lost. There's only one obstacle. Rakuro must reach level 50 to wield them, needing a rapid increase of 19 levels within only two weeks. Arthur instructs him and Kato to train in the futuristic iron ruins of the divinity near Sixenvelt. Rakuro is puzzled when Arthur provides him with a fishing rod, claiming it will be essential for surviving in the ruins. So, having overcome some sentry robots, Rakuro and Katsu follow Arthur's intricate map to a concealed room within the ruins, rumored to be optimized for rapid leveling. He is astonished as Rakuro explains that Katsu is a man playing as a female character. Locating the room, Tearlight Lake, they recall Arthur's claim that it houses the monster Lifestyle Lake Serpent, which, when caught with a fishing rod, yields substantial experience points. After bringing Lifestyle to the surface, Rakuro unveils his weapons for the time being. The Empire B Twin Blades, crafted by Emul's sister Belak, to use temporarily until he can wield the Moon Blades. Following the victory over Lifestyle, Katso introduces Skill Linking, a fundamental game mechanic along with the ability to secure a job or join a guild. Features Rakuro overlooked by skipping the tutorial in First Dia. After several days, Rakuro and Katso obtain levels 42 and 40 respectively. Embarrassed that he skipped the tutorial in First Dia like an idiot, Rakuro hides this from Arthur. Arthur sets a deadline until the full moon, the one time each month that they can communicate with the unique ghost NPC, Satsuna of Bygone Days. This NPC is the key to progress, providing them access to Weathermon. Arthur guides them to Satsuna's concealed sanctuary in the Prismatic Forest. She remarks that finding time-specific secrets like the entrance to the sanctuary is just pure luck. Walking through the hauntingly beautiful field, filled with spider lilies, they, like me, found it oddly creepy. There they find the NPC Setsuna, singing a slow song. She discloses that Weathermon blames himself for her demise, a consequence of a trivial martial dispute. In remorse, Weathermon sealed her grave behind a barrier fueled by moon magic, making it accessible only during the dark moon phase each month. She expresses the hope that their victory over Weathermon will reunite them. Observing Setsuna's clothing and language, Rakuro speculates on her backstory, pondering if her demise is linked to the Age of Divinity in the game and if she possesses knowledge about the Vorpal scenario. Rakuro knows Arthur's true identity as Toa, a supermodel perpetually pursued by fans. He wonders if this connection elicits sympathy from Arthur towards Setsuna. Considering Weathermon's flight pattern, Rakuro decides to put off leveling up and focus on tailoring his playstyle, not within Shangri-La, but in the BERP trash game based on Weathermon's combat approach. Engaging in training within Burp, he encounters Dragonfly, a novice gamer, and agreeing to a duel, he imparts glitch-exploiting techniques. Rakuro shows the novice how to use the glitches and take advantage of them. Meanwhile, Ray tries to write a letter to Rakuro, expressing her desire to join his party, but her embarrassment prevents her from sending any of these letters, despite her desire to play together with him. Dragonfly and Rakuro continue with the friendly duels, and Rakuro wins every single one of them using his high-level glitches. They eventually gather quite an audience, who are all surprised to see a new player join the game. Dragonfly refuses to give up, wanting to win at least one round against Rakuro, never giving up. She eventually wins one duel using a double punch glitch Rakuro and other players haven't seen before, impressing them, as no one had ever discovered a new burp glitch in years. In exchange, Rakuro shows her a glitch he discovered, Doppelganger, which creates a glitch clone of himself as an ally in duels. Dragonfly tries to come up with a name for her new discovery. Rakuro continues to show her more high-level bugs, and meanwhile, Katso endures more of Arthur's intense training to increase his level and skill. Returning to Shangri-La, Rakuro rubs through the Rabbitusa Palace, excited to try out the skill combo Katso had told them about. Imul is shocked at his sudden burst of energy, and Rakuro explains that he's always excited to discover and try new things. Rakuro visits Rabbitusa to meet Imul's triplet sibling, Elke, the skill gardener, hoping to unlock skill linking. Rakuro gets six linked skills along with the Vorpal Moonblade skill. Elk's greed left him nearly bankrupt. Arthur reveals the next problem. Since Ashurakai uses Weathermon to harvest experience, there will definitely be Ashurakai members there on the day of the duel, unwilling to let Weathermon actually die. Luckily, a new update has placed a restriction on assassins. If an assassin dies, all their accumulated money and some equipment get transferred to whoever kills them, leaving them totally harmless when they respawn. Therefore, before they can fight Weathermon, Arthur decides they must completely destroy Ashurakai by assassinating all of its assassins. 
house. Arthur leaves a store with a bag full of resurrection items, whistling on her way out. Just when she leaves, two more players enter the shop. To their dismay, the shop is all sold out, just like the two previous ones they visited. They wonder who could be buying all the high-level stuff. Moreover, they talk about how their clan leader is meeting up with other clans for a possible co-op raid against a powerful enemy. Shingrila then gets its massive new update with added quests, map expansion, and a new job title. Rei, on the other hand, paces back and forth anxiously, hyping herself up to send a letter to Rikuro. She finally manages to send Rikuro some mail, offering him to explore with her. She then receives a message from Saiger 100 that someone revealed the location of Shurikai's headquarters, so they're organizing a massive revenge attack. Rei has no choice but to send a follow-up letter to cancel the exploration offer. Both letters leave Rikuro confused. Since Emil won't go with him against Weathermon, she gives him a mysterious good luck necklace that she made. Ashurakai is wiped out by a massive army led by Rei, so Orcelot and four surviving assassins flee to Weathermon's arena but find the entrance closed as Arthur, Bakuro, and Kato are already inside. Orcelot furiously realizes his sister, Arthur, betrayed Ashurakai. They face off against the futuristic samurai, Weathermon. Arthur has determined that Weathermon varies his fighting style in stages, so the only way to win is to survive all the stages and hope Weathermon surrenders. Rukuro will handle the first phase, which lasts 10 minutes, but ends up dying early. However, with items collected from the towns, Kato deftly resurrects Rukuro. Arthur hands Rukuro and Kato the Tear Jewel of Rebirth. Going town to town, she bought all 12 of them that were up for sale. Each of them gets four of them in case of emergencies before the battle with Weathermon. And to add to that, she also hands out five divine life selves to each of them. It lets them revive at half of their maximum HP. Kansa tags in so Rukuro can regain his footing. Arthur reveals that Rukuro lasted a record-breaking time against Weathermon. Arthur spent a lot of money getting the respawn items and setting a plan in motion. She's hoping that they succeed. Rukuro notices that his weapons have degraded half their durability pretty quickly. Switching to another set of daggers, he tags back in. Using up more respawns, they survive the battle for 10 minutes. Then Weathermon swaps phases and summons his horse, a tactical mount named Kiden. Together, they attempt to prevent Weathermon from mounting Kiden by Kato attracting his attention and Rikuro continuing to fight Weathermon. In phase two of their mission, the team faces the challenge of surviving for another 10 minutes. Arthur becomes aware of Rikuro and Kato's situation and decides to utilize the reward scale, an exceptionally rare item borrowed from NPCs. This artifact in fact, grants the user the ability to sacrifice valuable items in exchange for temporary stat boosts. She spends the whole fortune for 300 points, giving 100 to Rokuro's luck and stamina, and he succeeds in taking away Weathermon's sword. Hippity hoppity, your sword is now Rokuro's property. After surviving 20 minutes in the battle against Weathermon, Arthur explains the last time Ashurakai reached phase 3, he unleashed a massive instant kill explosion. This time, though, she knows Weathermon is an undead, so as he prepares his explosion, she douses him with holy water. Arthur's plan succeeds in canceling out the insta-kill explosion. Weathermon gets back on its feet, but cracks begin to form in its armor. Along with that, a burning aura surrounds him. As Weathermon burns, Kieran reconfigures itself into a robot as a last stage form to help Weathermon. Kansa begins getting overwhelmed as they're in uncharted territory and have no plan for this sudden move. Rukuro instructs Arthur to go help Katso and prevent Kidden from aiding Weathermon. Rukuro faces Weathermon in a decisive battle, aiming for victory since he finds just surviving for 10 minutes to be rather boring. Equipping a quad beetle armor helmet and his moon blades, Rikuro takes the opportunity as Weathermon's armor weakens from the effects of holy water, making him finally vulnerable. Using the spiked helmet to deflect Weathermon's strikes, Rikuro launches counterattacks. With the skills acquired from LK enhancing his prowess, Rikuro's relentless assault forces Weathermon to stagger and finally collapse to the ground. Arthur offers Kato a temporary level boost to 99 in exchange for dropping his real level to 20 afterward, with the intention of using his enhanced abilities to defeat Kirin, despite his reluctance. Meanwhile, Weathermon's attention is drawn to the lucky necklace Rukuro retrieved from Emu. He cryptically mentions someone named Alice and hints at Shangri-La's true frontier before the fight resumes. However, Weathermon's demeanor changes drastically, becoming faster and more ferocious, launching attacks previously unseen and catching Rukuro off guard. Ta-da! Good luck, necklace. Sure made the boss angry. My rolling theory at this point is that it's his wife's necklace. His next attack destroys Rikuro's helmet and kills him, but Weathermon failed to notice that Rikuro had already set up another resurrection tool in advance to revive himself instantly. Weathermon continues to use a series of repeated attacks, ending in an unavoidable instant death move, declaring that he won't be defeated until Rikuro surpasses his ultimate 
technique. Rukuro finds himself running out of full resurrection items, with only 50% health recovery items remaining in his inventory. Rukuro realizes that his only chance of victory lies in perfectly parrying Weathermon's unavoidable instant kill attack. Arthur and Kato manage to shatter the armor around Kirin's waist, exposing its critical weak point. To their dismay, the weak point is not just a target, it fights back. Kirin fires off destructive lasers from the weak point, destroying everything it touches. Combining both their strongest attacks, they rush Kirin. Arthur, using her last two remaining spears, unleashes an attack. She locks Kirin down in place with her first spear and throws her second spear aimed for the weak point. Arthur was struck by a missile, but they finally found the weak point and destroyed Kirin, leaving them exhausted and collapsed on the ground. With no health items left, Rokuro faced his final chance for a perfect parry against Weathermon's unavoidable attack. Donning his original bird mask for luck, Rokuro fused his moon blades together into the twin moon, enhancing his chances for a successful parry and critical damage. Despite his health being 1.2 high to activate all of his skills, Rokuro deliberately stabbed himself, lowering his health to 1 and enabling him to use a skill to boost his speed. With one perfectly timed move, Weathermon's unavoidable attack is parried, snapping his sword and shattering his armor wide open, signaling his defeat. The arena fills with swirling cherry blossoms, and Weathermon congratulates Bakuro on his success. Weathermon praised Rakuro's skill, honoring him as the descendant of the frontier before fading away over Setsuna's grave. Setsuna's spirit, revealing herself as a perfect copy left to guide Weathermon in finding peace, thanked them and then tasked them with uncovering the truth behind the world by finding Bahamut. With Weathermon at peace, Setsuna's time was ending, but not before she left them with this mission. The game then announced to all players the defeat of a unique monster, and the start of a new stage in Shangri-La's world story. Saiger 100 was frustrated that another group had beaten her clan to it, but also curious how Rikuro, supposedly a beginner, managed this feat. Outside the Weathermon arena, Orcelot was furious at the betrayal. Matters escalated when Arthur, Katso, and Rikuro taunted him further, calling him names. Orcelot and his remaining allies attacked, hoping to claim the spoils, but Arthur summoned help using a friend summoning ability, bringing Rikuro's friend, Rei, to their aid. Ray was delighted to be called for help by Rikuro. Seriously, guys, find yourself a girl who's happy to fight assassins for you. Orcelot and his assassins meet their end, leaving all of Ashurakai's remaining rare items in Arthur's possession. With Arthur as the last remaining assassin, she seeks redemption and closure by challenging Ray to a duel. Ray accepts the challenge and emerges victorious, putting an end to Ashurakai once and for all. After killing Arthur, Rei, Rikuro, and Katso immediately start grabbing the fallen loot. Once they're done, Rei asks what kind of relationship Rikuro and Arthur have. She's relieved when Rikuro answers that they're just gaming buddies. The friend summoning expires, sending Rei back to where she came from before she can ask to join his party. Rikuro retrieves one of Arthur's swords Rei forgot to pick up. At Utopia Entertainment, the creators of Shangri-La Frontier, chaos ensues as the world story unfolds unexpectedly, with Weathermon's defeat occurring out of sequence. Tsukuyo and Ritsu, the lead world designers, clash in the midst of the turmoil, while Sakai, the marketing executive, attempts to restore order. Visash expresses contentment at Weathermon's departure and offers Rikuro a chance to uncover the truth behind the world. However, Rikuro must retrieve specific items from a mysterious location known as the Lightless Barons, with Visash providing little information on its whereabouts within Shangri-La. After defeating Weathermon, Rikuro discovers that his level has risen to 78. Along with this newfound strength, he acquires Weathermon's Truth, a biography detailing Weathermon's life, as well as a list of his exclusive sword techniques. However, to master these techniques, Rikuro must obtain weapons from the Age of Divinity. Additionally, he receives a unique item storage, ensuring the safety of his possessions, even if he dies. Upon inspecting the storage, Rikuro finds various items, including armor, weapons, and vehicles, although many are beyond his current capabilities. Starting anew at level 1, Arthur bids farewell to Setsuna before embarking on a quest to find Bahamut. Meanwhile, in the wilderness, Lysagon patiently awaits Rikuro's return. Kei Uomi, the guy behind the character Katsu, is a professional gamer with a big tournament coming up. However, he just can't bear to let Arthur and Rikuro keep playing without him. The moment Rikuro sends him a text about the inventory of key, he immediately logs back into the game, because who needs to focus on their career when you can be silly with friends? Examining the items within the inventory, Arthur discovers that none of the armor will be functional without a non-standard ether reactor. Unfortunately, they can't find that component anywhere. 
Kanso reveals he received one reactor as loot for defeating Kirin, but it's damaged beyond repair, and none of the NPC blacksmiths have the skill to fix it. Rukuro speculates that Visage might be capable of repairing it, but before handing it over, Kanso demands to learn how to access the Vorpal Unique scenario. Rukuro then explains the conditions for initiating the scenario, engaging in combat with Lysagon for five minutes, without taking any damage, and landing 200 critical attacks with a Vorpal weapon. Katsu and Arthur are frustrated at the impossible task, reluctantly accepting that it's beyond their capabilities. Arthur reveals a clever trick she used, exploiting a bunch of loopholes to keep several items, despite Raid defeating her in battle. Among the salvaged items are the reward scales, Weathermon's biography, Satsuna's brooch, and her cherished weapon. Recognizing the value of slaying a unique monster, they decide to establish a new clan the Wolf Gang, dedicated to hunting down all the unique monsters rather than focusing on just one, as other hunter clans do. A member of the Lysagon clan finds them, but they quickly evade him before he can ask any questions. Rukuro goes to talk to Visash, but can't seem to find him. In a bid to repair the damaged reactor, Rukuro approaches Bilak and proposes the idea of training to attain the title of Ancient Craftsman, which is necessary for the repair task. After some persistent persuasion, Bilak eventually agrees to the proposition. Rukuro has a new goal in mind, and even Bilak's ready to play along. However, he has no idea how to raise her to an ancient craftsman. Bilak steps up, outlining the prerequisites to become an ancient craftsman, a functioning legacy weapon from the Age of Divinity, and a magic application unit found only in the Road of Past Glories. Rukuro retrieves the katana known as Harbinger from the Inventoria, confirming it as a legacy weapon. Bilak needs to study the weapon thoroughly by dismantling it. However, there's a problem. As joint owners of the Inventoria, Rukuro needs Arthur and Kanso's consent before allowing Bilak to proceed with the disassembly. Opting to prioritize the journey to past glories, Rukuro sets off first. Bilak opens a detailed map pinpointing the location of past glories, situated between the towns of Eight Hold and Eleventar. Despite the considerable distance, Rukuro has no choice but to travel without delay. And by chance, Rukuro spots Lightless Barons on the map, close to Eleventar where he needs to find the receiver, positioner, and transmitter for Visash. Before they can leave, Bilak and Emul camouflage themselves as a fur coat and a scarf on Rukuro's back. Journeying through Fourfolk Shire into ancient Soul Canyon, the Lysagon's curse shields Rukuro from the miasma's effects and deters undead creatures. They come across an enemy known as Dullahan General. Working together, they vanquish the enemy, and Rukuro retrieves its battered sword, the Decapitator, trusting it to be lack for restoration. They press onward in search of the area boss hidden within the dense miasma. Rukuro brings up the idea of going through the mist atop the canyon since it'll be easier to navigate, but Bilak swiftly dismisses it as foolish due to the presence of crystal scorpions, dangerous enemies even she fears, given their high levels exceeding 100. Rukuro gives in, and they press onward, scaring off lower-level adversaries along the way. Their journey leads them to an ominous black dome, within which lurks the area boss, the Humming Lich. She proves immune to conventional physical attacks and can only be harmed by holy weapons. Unluckily, Rukuro Rukuro has no holy weapons in his inventory. The Lich unleashes a potent miasma that inflicts harm upon Rukuro. Bilak devises a plan allowing Rukuro and Emil to engage the Lich while she formulates a strategy. However, their situation takes a turn when the Lich divides into seven smaller skeletons, causing them some panic. By treating the decapitator sword with holy water, Bilak eradicates the rust, imbuing it with a holy attribute. However, the sword becomes incredibly fragile, capable of withstanding only eight strikes before shattering. Rukuro faces the task of defeating his enemy within eight attacks. After analyzing the attack patterns of each skeleton and realizing they share a collective health pool, Rukuro decapitates six of the clones. Working with Bilak, they focus their efforts on the original Lich, wielding the decapitator to deliver the final blow and narrowly avoiding destroying the weapon. With the defeat of the Lich, the oppressive miasma dissipates, allowing them to leave the canyon and get into Eight Hole. While Bilak and Emul opt to teleport to Rabatuza for much needed rest, Rukuro's insatiable thirst for battle leads him back into the canyon, unable to resist fighting a crystal scorpion. Rukuro scales the towering canyon walls until he reaches the crystal nest cliffs, marveling at the scenery before him. However, his awe is short-lived as he's immediately attacked by a colossal 
Crystal Scorpion. Dodging its relentless attacks with all his skill, Rikuro quickly realizes that his initial goal of defeating the Scorpions is nigh impossible. Adapting to the situation, Rikuro shifts all of his focus to scouting the area and gathering rare materials. Yet before he can make much progress, he finds himself surrounded by a horde of Scorpions and dies. Refusing to concede defeat without gaining something, Rikuro respawns in Rabatuza and resorts to bribing Emul with carrots to let him continue fighting the Scorpions. Returning to the Crystal Nest Cliffs, Rikuro discovers Black Crystals, identified as Aaron Clef Lapis, having high magical properties. Despite his repeated deaths, he continues, determined to obtain a trophy, a Scorpion Stinger. Crafting a plan, Rikuro tricks the Scorpions into colliding with each other and attacking when their hard shells shatter. Utilizing the inventory as a refuge, he teleports in and out, collecting broken shells as the Scorpions retreat. His stubbornness pays off as he manages to sever a Scorpion Stinger, but his victory is short-lived as he dies from another fatal blow. Rikuro decides to temporarily leave the Scorpion hunting and seek help from Belak, showcasing the materials he gathered. However, Emul is concerned about Rikuro's obsessive greed for loot. Belak reveals that the crystals are better suited for crafting jewelry rather than weapons, and she suggests using the expertise of Darnyata, one of the finest jewelers around. However, to transport the jewels to Dainarta, Belak has to summon Aramaeus, the hyperactive Kate Sith Vice Captain of Kazaria, the Kate Sith Kingdom. Feeling fatigued, Rikuro logs out momentarily, missing urgent messages from Arthur and Katso. Upon returning, he learns that Belak has given information about him to the King of Kazaria, causing the King to offer Kazaria's full support by providing Aramaeus as a party member. Belak explains that due to Rikuro's recognition by Lysagon and his defeat of the Weathermon, he now holds political influence comparable to that of an entire kingdom. Belak warns Rikuro of the potential risk of sparking a full-scale war if he's not cautious in his actions. As Rikuro ventures into Eight Hold, he finds himself swiftly identified, even under disguise by a magical girl whose voice bellies a deep masculine tone. She's none other than the Professor, the mastermind behind the library, a player clan dedicated to gathering the lore and history of Shangri-La. Given Rikuro's accomplishment of defeating a unique monster, the Professor proposes a partnership, aiming to dive deeper into the secrets surrounding the world of Shangri-La Frontier. And that's the end of the video. As always, if you liked what you saw, subscribe to the channel. I'll be uploading a lot of videos just like this, so I'll see you at the next one.